Hello, good evening, and welcome to the October My Macula and Me Macula Society webinar. Um, great, as usual, to have so many people on the call this evening, and you are very, very welcome. Thank you very much indeed for making the time to join us this evening. Um, a reminder that um, we'll be uh, inviting your questions later on uh, after our talk, so please do use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to pop your questions in um, as we go along, uh, and we'll come to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, before the end of the evening. Uh, my name is Cathy Yelf, I'm the Chief Executive of the Macula Society, and as I say, you are very welcome to tonight's, uh, to tonight's My Macula and Me. Now, if you've joined any of these in the past, you will know that we've heard from many experts in the years that we have been doing these webinars uh, about the need for more data to understand eye disease and conditions like age-related macular degeneration, especially data from real people. So big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we've talked about it often, but they offer the possibility of, of um, shortcuts, if you like, uh, in ways that would have been impossible to previous generations of uh, medical researchers. Uh, and so tonight we're going to be uh, talking about one of the projects that is gathering data from real patients over a long period of time, many years, uh, to get a better insight into ageing conditions like age-related macular degeneration. And I am absolutely delighted tonight to introduce you to Dr. Ruth Hock. Uh, Ruth is an academic optometrist and an epidemiologist at Queen's University in Belfast, the most beautiful, uh, beautiful building. Uh, she's going to show you some pictures of in a minute or two. Uh, Ruth has many research interests, including, by no means limited to, but including the developing of a home monitoring uh, system and equipment for AMD patients. And we know what a boon that would be to be able to monitor your own eye condition at home without having to go to hospital for scans. Um, understanding ageing is a very uh, in, uh, I I important part of Ruth's research, and particularly where ageing blurs into, normal ageing blurs into early stages of diseases. And of course, finding the earliest uh, manifestations of conditions like age-related macular degeneration is also a particular interest to Ruth because uh, until we can understand the early stages of the disease, it's very difficult to find new therapies and treatments that would prevent the progress of early AMD into the later stages, which lead to vision loss. Ruth leads uh, the eye component of a very interesting study called the Northern Ireland Cohort for the Longitudinal Study of Aging. So the, that is the Northern Ireland Cohort for the Longitudinal Study of Aging. For shortcuts, we're going to call this the NICOLA study. That is the acronym that it's uh, known by, and we'll be using that throughout the rest of the talk, the NICOLA study. It's an epidemiological study that is following 8,000 older adults in Northern Ireland. And, and it's looking across a whole range of Eye disease uh, of diseases, but particularly we, of course, are interested in age-related macular degeneration. And it's this project mainly that Ruth is going to be talking to us about tonight. So Ruth, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us and giving up an <coughs> October evening. It's lovely to have you with us. I'm going to hand over straight to you now to hear lots more about the Nicola study. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ruth Hogg. Thank you so much. I just I share on my screen here and yeah, is that all okay? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Fantastic. Uh, so thank you so much, Cathy, for that lovely introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to speak to you this evening and uh, to tell you a little bit more about uh, the Nicholas study and uh, our longitudinal aging study that's taken place in Northern Ireland. So uh, aging is something that we all can't escape. I, I was confronted very much this week. I, I had misled my staff pass and at some stage in the in the madness of uh, the lockdowns uh, for COVID and uh, it had been a bit of a mystery as to where it had, had, had gone and it just turned up a couple of days ago in uh, an old wallet and I, I was very much co uh, confronted with the concept of aging because I had to have a look at uh, my uh, staff photograph way back from when I started in Queens in in two hundred uh, in two thousand and ten, uh, and there definitely were uh, it was evidence of aging, 
And it's, it's something that there's a lot of talk about now, and particularly the concept of aging successfully. So it's not just about uh, how many years we ultimately live, but a healthy aging and a remaining healthy and active for as long as possible. So as scientific researchers, we're really keen to find out what are the components that enable people to age successfully. And I'm sure you can all think of, of people that you know, or you may be those people yourself that uh, remain really fit and, and active uh, into older age. And we want to understand the determinants that uh, help make that happen. So the strap line for Nicola, which is, is helpful, is understanding today for a healthy tomorrow. So it is, it's a, a study with a whole lot of different components. I just want to say that I, although I have slides here, there, none of the text I, adds any addition. I, I'll make sure and I explain all of the, the text for any of you that, that I aren't able to see just as well. So the, the Nicholas study is, it's part of, uh, there's a whole family of aging studies that are taking place in various parts of, of the world. There's the English Longitudinal Aging Study, which is known as ELSA. And there's one in the Republic of Ireland known as TILDA. And we're also linked with a study in the US, the, the Health and Retirement Study as well. And the plan with all of these studies is to collect a whole range of, of data uh, about people and then to follow them up. Uh, people who are who are living uh, free in the, the population. So these aren't hospital patients. Uh, these are people who are, are recruited from the, the community and uh, as much as possible represent the general population in these countries. And we collect a whole range of data, uh, including demographic data, medical a uh, histories, social histories, lifestyle, economics, and a uh, we are interested not in things like a uh, cognition, so a uh, how the brain is aging, cardiovascular system, and then in Nicola, which is is slightly more novel compared to the other studies, we've got quite a a, a strong eye component. Uh, because of some of the research strengths in Queens, where where we've got an active a uh, vision and ophthalmology research group. So the first wave of data collection took place between a uh, two thousand and thirteen and two thousand and sixteen, and during that time, there was about eight and a half thousand people uh, recruited from right across Northern Ireland, a uh, and they were invited based from administrative data sets to make sure that they were represented of the general, general population. And they had a, a CAPI or what's known as a computer assisted interview in their home. And it was about two hours in total of, of questions. Uh, they also completed a number of, of questionnaires themselves and uh, returned those. And then they were also invited to attend uh, a, a physical ass assessment or health assessment at the at one of the main hospitals in, in Belfast. We have a nice research facility uh, and uh, that was the, the location for the health assessment. So of the eight and a half thousand, there was uh, around three and a half thousand chose to do the, the additional health assessment. And it was during that that we were able to collect some interesting ocular data. So our, our the main aim of the eye component of Nicola, which is the, the, the part that, that I led, was to get a better understanding of the very earliest stages of age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma and, and diabetic retinopathy, and to understand the, the risk factors associated with uh, these diseases. And because it was mainly a, a normal population, just understanding the uh, subtle differences between aging and the development of these conditions. So the other thing that we wanted to do from all the eye data was also to look at uh, how useful 
the eye images were uh, in terms of, of getting an idea of the health of the rest of the body. Uh, th looking at uh, things like with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and then uh, changes in the, the brain as well. So uh, the eyes are, I think, uh, I may be biased because it's obviously my area of expertise, but uh, I think they're an incredibly interesting uh, organ to study. And one of the reasons is, is because the imaging a allows us to to see so much in the eyes compared to a so many other organs of the body. So basically, the the clear lens that allows a us to see out and a to to see around of us enables us as researchers to to look into the back of the eye. And over the last twenty years, the progress. In, in the development of really innovative uh, imaging that is uh, non-invasive. In, in most cases, there needs to be no uh, special preparations or injections or, or anything like that. It's just a matter of, of uh, taking photographs of the back of the eye. And it's been a very exciting time uh, within the ophthalmology and vision science community understanding the uh, structures in the back of the eye through these new imaging techniques and the relevance that they have to, to disease. <clears throat> the other thing about the back of the eye that uh, is important and is of interest to researchers is that you get these small vessels. So what we call the microvasculature. And uh, one of the things that, that we know now from, from research is that some of the very earliest stages of uh, diseases that occur in the rest of the body, like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and stroke, uh, can be uh, evident in these very small uh, vessels. And there's all sorts of sophisticated ways now of uh, analyzing the, the vessels, not just their, their thickness, but how a branch they are and a how how wiggly or wriggly or as we say tortuous a they are and then relating to this to both a whole body outcomes and then also a to specific eye diseases a and we also know that a within the the eye there's there's layers in the retina the part at the back of the eye that that we use for seeing that are directly connected to the brain. So again, there's this link between the eye and, and early changes at the back of the eye and uh, the brain. So it was for all of these reasons that we managed to uh, persuade the, uh, the leaders of the Nicola study to include uh, a substantial eye component uh, within the data collection. And a uh, what we were able to do was to collect a range of retinal images. And some of these are the types of images that you may be for, familiar with from trips to your, your macular clinic. But from the point of view of aging studies and uh, epidemiological studies, this was quite rare. Normally, uh, in these types of studies, the only type of image that's taken is a color fundus photograph, uh, where as we were able to take those, both of them, the disc and the, the macula, but we were also able to take a, the optical coherence tomograph or the, the OCTs, which a, allow us to get the layers of the retina. A, and then also we took these wide field images, a, sometimes known as Optomap or, or Optos images, which give uh, a much a greater view and extent of, of the retina. So uh, one of the remarkable things about the OCT images that uh, are, are now routinely taken in all macular clinics and are used to, to guide treatment is uh, that they effectively allow non-invasive a visualization of a an, the anatomy that a twenty five or thirty years ago would only have been possible 
a using from a, a histological slide. So it's it's really incredible that the different layers that that a uh, would have been seen just on on histology are now visible a uh, to a uh, within from clinic visits and then also we were able to collect from the Nicola study. <clears throat> So some of the other tests that we collected at the same time was we did the standard visual acuity eye chart to get an idea of how well the participants could see. We also checked uh, whether they were long or short sighted using an auto refractor. And we also measured their intraocular pressure, which helped us to determine whether they uh, had glaucoma or were a particular higher risk of developing glaucoma. So now moving on to some of the, the things that we've been able to investigate and, and find from that uh, baseline data. Uh, so as I've said, from the point of view of, of macular degeneration, one of the novel things was uh, the fact that we had all these different types of images, more than just the colour fundus photographs. And it allowed us to, to look at the early changes much more carefully. And to be able to know a uh, as the imaging techniques have progressed, a uh, the scientists tend to then find new a uh, features that are associated with with AMD, and they they tend to then from clinical populations g give them names, and a uh, so the clinicians can recognize these various features. But then the the question always is. A, we can see these things on clinical populations, but then how many people in the normal population have these features? So this was one of the, the useful things that we were able to do from the, the, the baseline A, Nicola data. And then because we had all the, the supplementary information on, on medical histories and A, what A, drugs people were taking and their, their genetic features, uh, we were able to, to look at the, the risk factors for AMD as well. So uh, I'm sure you're you're all quite familiar with the term drusen and the, the uh, small areas of, of kind of waste material that, that get trapped in the, the retina in the outer layers uh, of the retina uh, around where the photoreceptors are, there's there's layers known as the, the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane. And these are really important for getting all the oxygen and food stuff to the, our, our photoreceptors, which help us to, to see a and see fine detail. And it's these cells that we know as we get older tend to get clogged up with, with various different types of, of aging a uh, features and a uh, and also some of this waste material gets trapped and causes these kind of yellow spots that we're able to see on other uh, fundus photographs which we which are known as drusen so we know that drusen are really important in the development of a uh, <coughs> amd and a uh, we basically grade their severity in terms of the size of the individual drusen, where they occur and the type of, of texture that they have. And there's a whole range of, of uh, names and, and categorizations that we have. You can, uh, so from sort of big, large, what we call the ones with sort of that are quite large and uh, with ill-defined <clears throat> margins are known as, as soft drusen and then a uh, you can have small a uh, tiny much smaller with with clearly defined margins are known as as hard drusen and there there are various standard ways of of categorizing these and then being able to assign a uh, people to their their risk of of subsequently a uh, progressing to, to later stages of AMD on the basis of these findings so most of these classification systems are on these on the fundus photographs, the the, the basic standard imaging uh, that has been done in in most epidemiological studies. Uh, 
But within Nicola, obviously, we were able to look not just at the fundus photographs, but also at OCT and give information as to what the OCT features were in the normal population. So basically, within our a uh, population in Northern Ireland, we found that a uh, about three quarters of people, seventy five percent, fell into the category of normal aging. And uh, then we had about 16% were categorized as early AMD. 7.2% uh, had intermediate AMD. And then we just had 1.1% with uh, advanced AMD, which uh, includes both geographic atrophy or neovascular uh, wet AMD in, in their worst eye. So uh, this is broadly in keeping with other European populations that, that have done similar things. But <clears throat> one of the, the interesting things is that in the uh, home interview, people were asked uh, if they had AMD. And we realized that of, of those that we saw with advanced AMD on the retinal imaging, there was 40% of those didn't report uh, a positive history in a, when they were a, interviewed. And again, a, of the people who have intermediate AMD, and these tend to be, these are people that have got the larger soft drusen and, and more numerous drusen a, that we know are at a higher risk of, of developing a advanced AMD over a five-year period, there was only 8% of those participants were aware of their condition. A, so that that's something that a, we a, was definitely of concern and, and particularly now as, as more tr treatments a, gradually come a, to, to patients and also the possibility a, of, of treatments being within trials, et cetera, at an earlier stage. The challenge will be trying to, uh, if people don't know they have an intermediate AMD, they, they won't be able to, to uh, join these types of, of uh, possible early intervention trials. So one of the, the first sets of uh, papers that we published from the Nicola study was just helping people understand the di these different types of a uh, imaging and how they compared, a uh, because as I said, most epi studies just have the color photography. So one of the the useful things that a uh, we were able to to do the the grading using the the various different imaging and and a uh, show a uh, the community how they they compared and also with a uh, quite a lot of example images so that people could then a uh, learn from what what we had done and be able to recognize these features on some of these more novel types of of imaging so a uh, the other a uh, thing that, that we were able to look at because we had the OCTs uh, that we were able to look at uh, the vitreous, which is the, the jelly part uh, of within the inside of the eye. It kind of gives the eye its, its shape and it's another part of the eye that we know that uh, changes with, with age. And uh, there's been various reports uh, as to how it may relate to the de development of AMD as well. And uh, it's again uh, a feature that uh, has been able to be understood a lot more because of the images, the, the OCT images, uh, but was not well understood in the general population. So there was some uh, quite a lot of nice papers classifying different changes with age a uh, of the the vitreous, but a uh, these tended to be within clinical populations. So we were able to then apply these uh, classification systems and see how a uh, 
it uh, how how common the 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 features were in those in the general population. <clears throat> so one of the the interesting features uh, that we've been able to look at is this uh, a feature called an epiretinal membrane, and a uh, it is just where where the re the the retina all kind of gets a uh, crumpled and it and you end up with this kind of wrinkled appearance and it's a it can in some people it it doesn't affect their vision but when it's a and it's it's most kind of severe state it a can leave distortion so that a things look all a bit wobbly so this is a, a feature that that hadn't been really w that well a uh, characterized previously in epi studies or, or risk factors a uh, understood and we noted that there was a uh, about nearly eight percent of our population had some evidence of of this feature present and a uh, we were able to look at the specific risk factors that were associated with that a uh, and a uh, so it was it was those that were older it tended to be more a uh, common in in males and a uh, it did tend to end up with worse visual acuity so people's vision was affected and also more common in those that were short sighted and again with macular holes being able to look at the relationship a uh, there was some interesting associations with a uh, the the blood fats a uh, things like a uh, cholesterol and and a uh, uh, glycerides in in the blood so these were were some interesting associations that we've continued to a uh, look at with respect to the their genetics and some of a uh, we've identified some genetic factors in collaboration with the twin study in, in London uh, and again understanding more about how these features develop. <clears throat> the other thing that you may have uh, heard about in the context of AMD is, is macular pigment. So it's this really intriguing uh, substance, this kind of yellow layer that, that we see at the back of the eye, right, a most heavily concentrated at the a fovea, where we've got all our most detailed vision, and a the interesting thing about macular pigment is that it's something that our body can't make, a and it is completely derived from diet and from the the things that we eat. And it seems to be very specifically then a uh, deposited from our our blood, where it forms a, a, a very small component, and it's it's deposited in this in this very a uh, specific way at the back of the eye, and we know that it has has various features. So it has a it's can filter blue light, which uh, we know that a uh, blue light is at the short wavelength end of the spectrum and there is a can be concerns about the the damage that this this short wavelength light could do to this very sensitive part of the eye so therefore the pigment by filtering out the the blue light a uh, acts to protect a uh, the ma the the very center of the macula a uh, it also is known to be uh, a potent antioxidant as well so this is part of the eye where all our, our very detailed vision, our color vision is, and uh, it's a, a part that there's a lot of a uh, metabolic activity and a uh, some of the, the leftovers of this kind of activity can be the the free free radicals and the macular pigment may act to a uh, mop up some of these. So a uh, so one of the the novel imaging sets that we have from the a uh, Nicholas study is this a uh, macular pigment and so we've been able to do some analysis on that 
and from the these autofluorescent images and we've been able to to map them and our preliminary an analysis looked at the relationship with a cognition and a cognitive decline as some other studies had shown relationships and this is a seems to be the case again in the Nicola study as well we a uh, since our initial analysis there is a new method has been developed by our collaborators uh, at the University of Alabama to analyze these images so we're in the process of of reanalyzing them all according to this new kind of gold standard method and and we hope to then be able to look at the relationships between the amount of macular pigment at the back of the eye and AMD, glaucoma, diabetes, and a uh, and cognition as well. So that's something that we have a uh, with three students working a uh, on at present. And a uh, with the, the macular pigment, it's a uh, uh, things like spinach and and kale and sweet corn and a uh, things green leafy vegetables and and yellow vegetables that that contain these constituents of the macular pigment that are then deposited at the macula. So the other novel part of a uh, Nicola were was these ultra wide field images. So a uh, the standard fundus images just cover the the central part of the eye, a uh, whereas there is a large area beyond that that a uh, traditional imaging just doesn't a uh, capture. And because this central part of the eye is the bit that we use for our detailed vision, I, I guess that's that's why people have been content up to this point to just concentrate on that. But more and more now with these uh, developments in, in the wide field imaging and the more that we collect, we realize that there is a lot more going on in the uh, periphery of the eye. Uh, so you'll see this then involved some uh, incredibly detailed analysis by a PhD student, Nicola Quinn, because she was then able to, she put this huge grid on the images that had a uh, 400 squares and then was able to uh, click on which square a feature was found. So if she saw, saw drusen or a little hemorrhage or, or something like that, uh, and the number within each square, and uh, then all of this data was able to be uh, recorded. And she looked at those, I think there was 21 different features that, that we had identified from the literature that could potentially occur in the, the, the retinal periphery. Uh, in the population. So she was able to go through uh, all of those. And uh, some of the interesting things uh, was that in the, the periphery, over 85% of people had what, what we would describe as hard drusen. So the, the small uh, deposits that similar to those that we would traditionally seen in the center uh, in, in AMD and uh, about six and a half percent had the the soft drusen. So the the interesting thing is in trying to understand how these peripheral changes relate to AMD, which has been traditionally very much considered as a, a, a macular condition. And this is one of the sets of, of data that we are most excited about collecting a follow up data, a hopefully next year about a uh, because there has been quite a lot of discussion and quite a lot of controversy over a uh, some of our our findings though, though they have been confirmed and the, there's one other there's a, a Reykjavik eye study has these wide field images as well a uh, but there's still some of the the broader AMD community a uh, are are a little uneasy with us describing things as drusen in the, in the periphery so a uh, one of the challenges now for the follow up visit we're hoping that we can actually get oct images in the, the periphery so that we'll be able to actually see where these deposits uh, are and whether they are 
a uh, similar in in where they they lie within the layer layers of the retina compared to the the macular ones. So some of the fun things that we've been, we were then able to do with a uh, Nicola's data because she had this and yeah the confusion between Nicola the PhD student and Nicola the study was a uh, was uh, quite a, a lot of confusion for a few years. But through her very detailed analysis, we were then able to draw heat maps of where these features tended to occur. So you can see this is the soft reason. So you can see that the, the dark red shows you they were a uh, very, very common as we would expect in the center in the, the macula. But then there was also this other kind of hot spot of, of tended to be right out in the, the uh, temporal part of the, the far periphery and that a uh, pattern was seen in both eyes a uh, and again the retinal pigment epithelium changes which a uh, a uh, uh, again we sometimes see some changes in a uh, an amd there was a uh, uh, while there was a few noted in the macula they again tended to be out in this a uh, temporal area away out in the far far periphery a uh, hemorrhages tended to be scattered all over, a uh, and as well as the the hard drusen were were scattered all a uh, over as well. So that's again another study to be our story to be continued for in our our follow up data. So some of the challenges with this has been a uh, the range of things that we've measured and then trying to a. Uh, to analyze this in, in a kind of smart way. So we have a collaborated and through funding from the Macular Society, we've been able to bring in some a data scientists and a also computer scientists a, to be able to look at these complex relationships a, in, in sort of new and more novel ways. And we're a, in the process of kind of trying to, to tie that data together and also the various complex networks that they have now been able to identify to understand these and with the follow-up data it will be interesting to see the a relevance of of some of these a uh, patterns that we're noting in the data so the baseline data a uh, as I said earlier, it was collected between a uh, 2013 and 16. And then about five years later, there was a second a uh, home interview completed. So, and I think there was about 70% of the original cohort uh, took part, which was great. And there was also some additional people recruited at that time again, a uh, from the, the younger ages. So the, the whole cohort, it's all 50 plus. So they had what they call a cohort refresh. So they brought in some new people as well. And then a uh, the plan again with a uh, funding from the Macular Society and a uh, Glaucoma UK and some from the, the Department of Health in the North in Northern Ireland. We are planning another data collection a uh, in 2024, and a uh, most importantly to to recollect some of these retinal images so that we'd be able to see a uh, who has went on a uh, progressed either in a amd glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy and then be able to look at again at these risk factors for progression there's also this rich biobank of genetic data that we're continuing to analyze and and quite a lot of biomarkers from blood samples and again, these will be collected again uh, next year. And also the plan is to add a microbiome from a, which is the kind of bugs that are in your, your digestive system, which there's a lot of interest at the minute at how that relates to aging and, and development of, of disease. So again, quite novel data. <clears throat> and in addition, I'll be taking part in a uh, this horizon europe a uh, project which is known as ice screen which is predicting conversion to wet amd so i uh, will be recruiting a uh, 
Nicola participants who have a bilateral drusen and then also participants from Northern Ireland from optometrists who have bilateral drusen and will be following, giving them the opportunity to be followed up every uh, four months for two years. Uh, and that is to, to refine and develop a uh, artificial intelligence algorithms for, for picking up uh, this conversion to, to wet AMD in, in those at, at high risk. So uh, that's uh, an, adi an additional plan for next year as well. And the other thing with Nicola is that it's very much a, a collaborative resource and a bio resource, not just for those of us working at Queen's, but uh, there's uh, access to, to researchers worldwide. And we've had the privilege of, of collaborating with, a, with quite a few collaborations within the, the UK and a, we're a, a key member of the Eye Epidemiology Consortium. And then with also collaborations in with those in America and Australia, and that the the follow up again next year will hopefully be of benefit not just to us in in Queens, but a resource for AMD researchers worldwide. So I had a fantastic team of of PhD students working on the baseline data and uh, also uh, in Belfast with Usha Chakravarthy, Tundapeto and Augusto Aguero Blanco as the, as the uh, ophthalmologists involved uh, and a whole range of, of funders including uh, the, the Macular Society and then obviously always uh, being incredibly grateful to our Nicola participants who have been uh, committed to the project. So, so very happy to answer any questions that you have? Ruth, thank you very much indeed. What an interesting project. Um, it's fascinating. Thank you so very much indeed. Questions are coming into the chat. Please do put your questions into the chat uh, and we'll come there. If you want to stop sharing your screen uh -huh. and we'll like to see you in glorious Technicolor, <laughs> that's great. That's absolutely lovely. One thing that of course strikes you um, immediately with these projects is you have to take a long view, don't you? This is <laughs> this is not something that happens at overnight. So, how long has the Nicola project been going now? When when was the first uh, start? So what, what, it years? was uh, yes, ten years. So, and I guess we were. I think that was when the first patients were were in. So our participants. So yeah, we were would have been planning even before that. So, uh, and yeah, at that stage, you know, even ten years to me seemed a uh, incredibly long time but it, it is amazing the way it it just goes like a a blink and you can see the the importance of of both uh, you know funders and universities having the the foresight to, to kind of a uh, fund these types of long game projects because a uh, yeah it, it is it is doable when when those of us hang around long enough to see it through it, but it, you do need this I, I can remember we had um one of uh, um uh, um uh, researcher who who led our research committee for for se se several years he'd been working on a on a genetic um treatment uh and he he they'd found a really key point um in this in this enormously long project after 20 years and we was saying, absolutely amazing, Jim. How you know, twenty years? It's a, he said. Well, actually, we thought it would take us thirty years. So it, it is. It is a career length job, isn't it? Sometimes cracking these really difficult research nuts, you've really got to be willing to stick with it. Uh, yep, definitely. And I think that's what's what's ex exciting now about the, uh, the Nicholas study. Those for a few years there, it looked a little bit bleak that. There wasn't going to be a, a wave three, and that follow up wasn't going to happen. But a uh, now you, you know it's even we're we're in the process of of planning wave four uh, as well. You know it does look like it is going to be a uh, very much a long term, and the university has a uh, committed co funding for core staff and 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 things like that. So then that's what what starts to really motivate us again and get us a uh, excited a uh, about it. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the complexity of the funding is, is is a whole different problem. So let's get on with some of some of these questions now. So um, Drusen is, is clearly from your research shows how critically important the presence of Drusen 
uh, are, to, are, are to these um, some of these diseases. Question here, can drusen be normal in older eyes without AMD? And are drusen ever found in younger people? Interesting question. Uh, yeah, so they, they are. And I, I think that's where the, the distinction with the, the type of, of drusen, I think it's the more recent classifications are seem quite content with calling the, the just the presence of small hard drusen just normal aging and a quite a, there can be people have a small hard drusen just their entire life and again the softer drusen and some of these other drusen types a while we can see on a kind of population basis that that it then leaves you in a in a in a slightly higher risk category we're by no means a uh, guaranteed that the presence of these that that you definitely will go on which is is why we're doing there's there's so much puzzling about trying to predict conversion because we really still aren't good at that a uh, although we can kind of give percentages and th there still is people who uh, have you know quite significant reason for for long periods of time in both eyes and and I uh, thankfully never c convert so a uh, it's a uh, yeah one of these these kind of conundrums that it, it is it's a very complex uh, picture that isn't it um some somebody has asked can you get rid of drusen suppose you've got we normally think of them um, don't we, as as you describe these sort of waste products that build up, presumably, am I right in, in saying because the the sort of process of as we age, the process of um, kind of clearing this system, this waste disposal system, slows down a bit as we age. Is that is that the theory? And so you can get this build up of this waste material. Can you do anything to get rid of them? A uh, yeah the definitely some of the of the other long term studies that have have looked. Specifically, a drusen can see that that a drusen kind of come and go in their their kind of location. I I don't think I don't think it's you know we know in addition to drusen you know there is a the other kinds of risks risk factors of kind of healthy healthy diet a physical activity and and not smoking are all important. A factors in in kind of keeping your your macular macular happy and healthy as well you know so those are a uh, important and the i know that uh, there's also various trials at, to uh, try and kind of low low level lasers etc to to try and clear drusen so uh, there is you know quite a lot of a uh, research going on and a uh, and yeah, yeah these kinds of longitudinal studies where you can follow up the the evolution and what will be good in, in Nicola is, is because we'll have the OCT which gives us the really exquisite detail uh, as to how the the drusen change over time imaging of, of the retina has just changed changed the game hasn't it completely so i guess there's not a great deal of evidence that actually if you've got quite a lot of drusen that you can fix it by eating lots of cabbage might be a bit late in the day yeah. for doing that but but certainly diet we think is important and, and people are asking questions about vegetarian diet and 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 uh, you know what to eat to achieve good macular pigment the the, the evidence seems to be that dark so you, you talked about this pigment at the back of the eye this yellow pigment and as I, I i think i'm right saying that the macula lutein the full name of the macula mm -hmm. just means is latin for yellow spot isn't it and that is because the the, the um the spot uh, the macula appears yellow uh post-mortem uh, you can't see it in a in a living eye because of the blood blood vessels but it is this yellow pigment and this is mainly lutein isn't it that we mm. see that we we know is a plant dye that you get from your diet from dark green leafy vegetables so there is some evidence i think isn't there that people who have a good diet with lots of dark green leafy vegetables have better macular pigment and that may protect them from macular disease is yeah, right? it's 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 quite the it's quite an intriguing 
substance because there is also a huge intra individual variation in in and it's not all while obviously there's a, a component of it a or a substantial component is diet is how much people eat but there is a some suggestion that there there may be people who who even if they eat a lot they they can't a uptake it there, there's some specific proteins etc that are are required to kind of carry it and 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 deposit it so there there's some of that 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 is still not well understood and i think that's what i'm kind of excited if we can f finally get on this kind of large data set to be able to look at some of these relationships and particular to see if there's any genetic components that that may be driving these 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 differences between people but a uh, in general a uh, this kind of the mediterranean type diet with a uh, fruit and veg and and a yeah green leafy veg all of these kinds of things and and also a lot of these good nutrients then also need a little bit are, are fat soluble so the importance of of you know taking salad with with some olive oil etc to make sure that the the nutrients that you're taking in are are available to your a uh, to absorb as well is important great that's that's great so an, another question here um is um you mentioned epiretinal membrane I have an epi epiretinal membrane. <laughs> it seems to run in my family because my mother had as well. Um, uh, and somebody here, this is quite a technical question, a PVD, post, post posterior vitreal detachment. So this is a condition, and I've also had one of these as well myself, uh, when the jelly bit of the eye kind of gets stuck, doesn't it, to the back of the eye, and then it can pull away and you get some sort of floaters and things like this from the jelly uh, of that. So this question here, here is can this phenomenon, this post vitreal detachment, cause an epiretinal membra membrane in in people? Is is one? Do, I mean, I'm I'm asking you an ophthalmology yeah. question. You're not an ophthalmologist, <laughs> so this may be, slightly, maybe slightly something slightly. you're not comfortable answering. <laughs> uh, so we did we did a uh, we did evaluate uh, the presence or absence of the the vitreous uh, detachments. A uh, not completely i think the two things are possibly slightly different a uh, but and a uh, but uh, yeah i think yeah i'll maybe pass on that one <laughs> i think yeah. you if it's still that's fair enough huh? that's that's fair enough um <laughs> blue light uh, you talked about blue blue light and mm -hmm. the concern that that this short wavelength blue light um might be impl implemented impl implicated in retinal damage and that this layer, this yellow pigment, protects against the blue light. What what are the sources? Somebody wants to know what are the sources of blue light. Where do we get blue light from? Uh, so I guess there is quite a lot of our, our electronic equipment and uh, and screens and 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 things like that, sort of artificial light sources. But I think it, it's definitely one of those things that a uh, is is more a theoretical risk than a uh, I think any uh, attempts I think there was a, a recent Cochrane review looking at at blue blocking lenses and various things and you know that the, although the, there's a the theory the evidence isn't uh, you know really strong on the on that end of of things so a uh, but there's no doubt that you know some of the the epi studies would, uh, would sort of general kind of sunlight protection uh, can be important and a uh, throughout lifetime you know making sure that that in strong sunlight etc that you, that you're wearing sunglasses and and uh, sunglasses that have the appropriate a uh, criteria or yeah classifications or whatever that 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 they are actually able to. A, remove the, the harmful parts of, of sunlight. Yes, you, you need to have blue, uh, UV blockers, uh -huh, don't you? Yeah, not, yeah. not just dark, darkening. And uh, somebody explained it to me that if you, if you don't have um, ultra, ultraviolet filters in your sunglasses, you just darken the sunlight. Then actually what happens is that your eye, your, your pupil widens because of the darkness. You actually let more uh, harmful light in. So you, you've got to buy reasonably good quality uh, sun, sunglasses. Question, question here. Um, uh, this is interesting. Is it worth looking at and dissecting 
the eyes of participants who have died during your project? Slightly grisly question, but it, it is interesting, isn't it? Um, of course, people are very reluctant to part with their eye tissue yeah. when they're living. And so we don't really have a lot of good eye tissue to look at, do we? Yeah, I th- yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult balance between a... We would love to, to be able to... We have, we have absolutely fantastic world, world-class world researchers in the, the basic science end of things that, that, that would be able to do incredible... A, things should such material be available but we've just never been been brave brave enough to a uh, address and i think i guess it is it's something that uh, as macular society and macular society members just even talking to a uh, uh, to their their community and to their uh, about that need for researchers to get access to to eye tissue because i know in the uk it it is much more more difficult than a, in some other countries, which is a shame and definitely holds back research, but a, it's just such a tricky subject. It, it is difficult. And we have funded work in Manchester at the Manchester Eye, Eye Bank, which is led by um, Paul Bishop, Professor Paul Bishop, who used to um, chair our, our research committee, and we funded quite a lot of his work. But it is difficult um, because of the way in which organ donation in the in the UK is set up uh, to retrieve eye tissue, uh, and and it uh, and I think retinal tissue particularly um, it, it is quite difficult to, mm. um, to 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 collect. So it's a, it's a difficult area. Uh, if if we could, um, I'm sure that um, yeah. I'm sure we would. A- our collaborators in the University of Alabama, you know, Christine Kershaw, and with they have some longitudinal cohorts, and and it is incredible what they've been able to show by having the you know sequential images from the patients within the the cohort, and then because they've been able to get access to the the eye tissue and and to be able to 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 really. A exquisitely tie up the histology then with with this kind of progression so it can be an incredibly useful thing we're very interested in fun in funding um because uh, one of the problems uh, animals don't in general have maculae so that's quite mm. a difficult thing you can't use animals which is not anything that anybody wants to do in any event um so we're looking at, at creating uh, funding work that creates um, an artificial retina, if you like, from stem cells, for oh, example, yeah. and, and also potentially creating a virtual eye from com- computer modeling and so on. So trying to look for ways ways around the problem. Another question here, and you mentioned that eye scans, these, these wonderful OCT images that we have, we can really look, we're looking at the brain, aren't we? I mean, a lot of the cells of the retina are effectively um, neurological cells, they're, mm. they're brain cells, and so they can we can see a lot of other early stage disease by looking at the eye, uh, including neurological diseases, perhaps like dementia, the dementias and Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and some of the other neurological neurodegenerative diseases. The question here is, is there any evidence that anything is emerging yet as a link between some of these neurological diseases? And this question I particularly ask, a link between dementia and AMD. Don't want to frighten anybody here. Yeah, <laughs> so this so, is just really a theoretical question whether there could be any co- similarities between or link between those. Has has your research yeah, discovered anything? I think you, we did we did look at it, but the there was a there was nothing significant. Though the the kind of caveat with that is that within our population we had a very very small people a very small number with with a dementia and the a relatively small number that would have fallen into the of sort of early cognitive decline so it, it's one of those things that I just don't think we had enough people in at that stage but there's some of these things that with the the longitudinal data that hopefully we'll be able to look at in in more detail because maybe there will be a, a greater proportion of of the more end stages of 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 these a uh, conditions because with a a lot of these epi studies it is it's it's the numbers that you have within the cohort that kind of determine how how sort of more subtle 
relationships, whether you pick them up or not. Okay, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. It's just coming up to eight o'clock. A couple of questions here about the stage of AMD to advise people on taking supplements. Another one about whether passive smoking is is an effect on uh, on AMD. And I think possibly passive smoking, we know is terribly bad. And and su supplements, the, the jury's out, I'm afraid. Yeah. We just don't really know what the answer and, to that is. And my my normal response to that is, is go to the Macular Society website because uh, you have some lovely material there. So and You took like, the words out of my mouth. I the words out. <laughs> what I was going to say was, if you've got a question on here and we didn't get around to it tonight, please do call our advice line, our helpline, which will be there from 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And the number is 0300 3030 111. And we're going to put that in the chat now, 0300, 0300, 30, 30, 111. Uh, from nine o'clock uh, tomorrow, they will be there uh, to answer any of these questions that we didn't really get around to tonight and we didn't have time. So I'm so sorry if we didn't. Ruth, thank you very, very much indeed uh, for joining us tonight. That was such an interesting talk. And I'm very, very grateful to you, in Indy, for giving up your time to us this evening. Thank you to everybody for joining us. As ever, we've recorded this uh, talk, so it will be on our website in a little while. And you can either watch it again if you joined late or, or, or want to recommend it to somebody else, which is also very good indeed. If you could um, draw it, atten draw it uh, to the attention of other people you think might benefit from uh, learning a little bit more about this. Um, 0300 30 30 111 is the helpline number you can call tomorrow, anytime during working hours, Monday to Friday. Um, next month will be our last webinar of the year, last webinar of the year, uh, and we'll be talking to Professor David Kavanagh from Newcastle uh, University, who is working on the immune system and the genetics of our immune system to understand what might lie behind some of the uh, um, reasons for developing uh, age-related macular degeneration, another project that's being funded by the Macular Society. So we'd love you to join us for that. Uh, that's uh, on the, the same the same week, same time next month in November. Meanwhile, Ruth, thank you very much indeed again for joining us. I'm so grateful thank to you. you. Thank you to all of you for joining us as well. And I hope you'll come again next month. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.